Panel of witnesses, it's promptly two o'clock, so we're, gonna, we're getting started. On our second panel, we have the Honorable E. Scott Pruitt, the Attorney General of the State of Oklahoma, the Honorable Adam H. Putman, Florida Commissioner of Agriculture on behalf of the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, the Honorable Sally Clark, District 3 Commissioner for El Paso County, Colorado, on behalf of the National Association of Counties, the Honorable Timothy Mock, District 1 Commissioner for Clear Creek County, Colorado, and Lem Sorolovic, Environmental Protection Bureau Chief for the New York State Attorney General. Hope I got your name right. <laughs> okay. Okay, I ask uh, unanimous consent that all our witnesses' full statements be included in the record. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Since your written testimony has to be made in part of the record, please limit your summary to five minutes if you can. And uh, Attorney General Pruitt, uh, welcome, and you may proceed. Sorry. Go ahead. I want to. I want to make a brief. It'll be a very brief introduction. But uh, you know, a lot of times you have people from your own state come in, and you want to participate in it. In this case, this is one who's not just a really a great attorney general, uh, and one who's doing things that other attorneys general are not doing. But he also is a best friend. So I was delighted, uh, Scott, to have you you here and participating and uh, sharing your thoughts with us today. Well, you're very kind, Senator Inhofe. Thank you for those kind comments. Uh, Chairman Inhofe and Schuster, ranking members Boxer and DeFazio, members of the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works, and House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, I uh, thank you for this opportunity to discuss the Environmental Protection Agency's proposed rule to redefine waters of the United States and the significant negative impact such a rule would inflict on states and landowners within our borders. Respect and protection of private property rights sets the United States apart from other nations and has fueled the greatest expansion of ec economic freedom the world has ever known. Indeed, private property rights are among the foundational rights of any functional democracy, uh, not just our own. President Obama's EPA currently stands poised to strike a blow to private property proposed rule that unlawfully expands EPA's jurisdiction by subjecting land use and water management decisions historically reserved to the states to the heavy regulatory hand of the federal government. The proposed rule aims to redefine what constitutes a navigable water or waters of the United States, a term that has long been understood to include only significant bodies of water capable of serving as conduits for interstate commerce. The proposed rule redefines those terms to now include virtually every body of water in the nation right down to the smallest of streams, farm ponds, and ditches. This is a naked power grab by the EPA. Now, don't get me wrong, the EPA should have a role in solving and contributing to interstate water quality issues and answers. But when having a role becomes having regulatory primacy at the expense of state authority, the will of this body is undermined and landowners and state losers as they are left to the mercy of agency power absent a voice when the system wrongs them and wrong them at will. Simply put, the proposed rule is a classic case of overreach and flatly contrary to the will of Congress, who with the passing of the Clean Water Act decided that it was the states who should, who should plan the development and use of local land and water resources. <laughs> The EPA has generally been unresponsive to concerns expressed by states, local governments, and individual citizens, with their primary tactic being a public relations campaign designed to sway opinion in rural America. EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy has been documented as dismissing many concerns wholesale, calling them ludicrous and silly, while also asserting that the proposed rule is all about protecting waters, quote unquote, and providing clarification. To Administrator McCarthy, who appeared before you today, I say, forgive the skepticism of the states. But these reassurances are from the same administration that said, if you like your health insurance, you can keep your health insurance. So as the old adage says and commences, trust but verify. And though we'd like to trust the EPA's intent, something doesn't add up. This rule smells far more, like a far more than a clarification. Indeed, it reeks of federal expansion, overreach, and interference with local regulations. Notably, there are several United States Supreme Court decisions illustrating that the intended regulatory ju jurisdiction of the EPA has been limited to the navigable waters of the United States while all, with all other waters rightly left for the states to regulate. At the time that the Clean Water Act was passed, the Supreme Court had previously defined navigable waters of the United States as interstate waters that are navigable in fact or readily susceptible of being rendered so. In recent cases, the Supreme Court has that any examination of federal jurisdiction must first begin 
with an understanding that Congress intended the states to retain primacy over the development of and use of local land and water resources. With the proposed rule, the EPA is ignoring this core tenet of the CWA and endeavoring to write itself a regulatory blank check. On another note, and critically, the proposed rule includes a vague catch-all category defeating the EPA's claim purpose of the rule providing transparency, predictability, and consistency to the scope of the CWA jurisdiction. Instead, the EPA has simply redefined the meaning of navigable waters in an extraordinarily broad way so that any landowner may be subject to owner's permitting requirements or severe civil penalties if violated, even if unknowingly. Oklahoma has seen firsthand, Senator, how the federal government, specifically the EPA, abuses its regulatory power in states that have interest in energy, farming, and ranching. The states are not and should not be used as a vessel to carry out the will of regulators in Washington, who often seem to have little regard for how their actions negatively impact the economy and private property rights. During the comment period for this rule, Oklahoma filed its objections. In fact, uh, my office led a coalition of 16 states uh, to file comments about the lawfulness of this rule or unlawfulness of it. Additionally, as the Chief Law, Law Enforcement Officer of the State of Oklahoma, I can say with confidence that if the EPA continues forward with this rule as proposed, the rule will be challenged in court. If this rule is issued as proposed, we will all live in a regulatory state where farmers must go before the EPA to seek permission to build a farm pond to keep their livestock alive, where, where home builders must seek the EPA approval before beginning construction that contains a dry creek bread, and where energy producers are left waiting for months or even years to get permits from the EPA, costing producers tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars that inevitably will be passed on to consumers. Chairman Inhofe and Schuster, ranking members Boxer and DeFazio, the EPA's proposed rule is unlawful and should be withdrawn. We urge the EPA to meet with state level officials who can help the agency understand the careful measures the states already have in place to protect and develop the lands and waters within their borders. But most of all, we urge the EPA to take note of the harm that this rule will do to the property rights of citizens across the country and their ability to make land use decisions. Thank you, Chairman, for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Putman, you have uh, the floor. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, uh, I think I liked the old view better than this view. But uh, I sincerely hope that the plague which has overtaken these two great committees will pass quickly and that and, uh, our, our prayers will be the, with the members who, uh, who are unable to join us for this. But it's a, it's a pleasure to be on this panel and to represent not only the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, but also the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture. I come here as a farmer, a citrus and cattleman, a former member of Congress, and a um, and an agriculture commissioner and someone who has dedicated much of my career to water policy, water resource development issues. I'm proud of the record that our state has in, in protecting uh, water, including through agricultural best management practices, putting 10 million acres of agricultural lands in the state under best management practices, or 90 percent of our intensive agricultural lands, and saving 20 billion gallons per year of water through those practices. The EPA asserts that the purpose of this rule is to clarify which waters are and are not subject to the Clean Water Act. The EPA claims that the proposed regulations will not significantly change what currently is considered waters of the U.S. They also claim that the proposed regulations will not substantially affect regulated communities like ours. I believe this is yet another attempt by the EPA to regulate areas outside their authority and in contradiction to guidance given by the courts. Counter to the claims by the EPA regarding intent, the proposed rule, in fact, will lack clarity, significantly expand federal jurisdiction, impose burdensome requirements on agricultural producers, and impede efforts to protect and restore the environment. The proposed rule creates more ambiguity regarding what areas are subject to the requirements of the Clean Water Act and will most certainly result in an expansion of jurisdiction. Specifically, the proposed rule does not clearly define adjacent, neighboring, riparian area, and floodplain. In combination, the application of these terms expand federal jurisdiction to include all wetlands or other waters similarly situated across a watershed or that share a shallow subsurface hydrologic connection. What is more concerning is the intent by the EPA and the Corps as communicated in their narrative accompanying the rule to evaluate application of floodplain and watershed on an individual basis. I fail to see how individual interpretation by EPA and core staff guarantees clarity to the regulated community in implementation of this rule. Further, the EPA failed to take into account the unique landscape of states, like Florida, when developing their approach. 
Florida's flat topography and broad expanse of floodplains, wetlands, and sloughs could subject nearly all of Florida's water to federal jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act. Under this rule, isolated wetlands located miles from the nearest navigable water and never before considered jurisdictional would now be defined as waters of the U.S. simply because they are located in the same watershed and therefore under federal jurisdiction. Even concrete-lined conveyances and other man-made systems intended to capture and treat stormwater could be subject to federal jurisdiction. An independent analysis by Breedlove, Dennis and Associates, an environmental firm, found in specific instances where the proposed rule, if implemented, would expand jurisdiction from 13 to 22 percent on the two subject parcels alone. Across the nation, farmers and ranchers are good stewards of the land, and the expansion of the federal jurisdiction under this rule will deem many areas of farmland as waters of the U.S. and therefore subject to federal jurisdiction. Areas of more, with more areas of farmland categorized as waters of the U.S., farmers will be forced to obtain new permits, including Section 402 and 404 permits. The requirement to obtain additional permits will involve fees for attorneys and technical consultants whose expertise is required to ensure an, an accurate application. An independent analysis conducted in 2002 revealed that Section 404 permits cost an average of $338,000 or $300,000 more than the permit required for areas not considered waters of the U.S. As a national leader in water quality protection and restoration, the state of Florida works closely with the EPA. And EPA in the past has actually praised the work that we do as being among the most rigorous protections in the nation. But these proposed requirements will impede and in some cases dismantle environmental programs statewide. The expansion of Clean Water Act jurisdiction to marginal waters such as stormwater ditches and ponds will actually have the effect of diverting local, state, and even federal funds from restoration efforts for truly critically impaired and important natural areas. So instead of funding those priorities, limited resources will be diverted toward municipal storm system upgrades. Florida's best management practices are an example where farmers and ranchers work cooperatively and in partnership to improve wetlands and water, uh, watershed areas. The, impl the implementation of this proposed rule and the associated expansion of federal jurisdiction will decrease landowner willingness to voluntarily participate in these programs. The proposed rule will decrease wetland protection and restoration in our state because landowners will now fear that their restoration activities will bring them under federal wetlands jurisdiction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to your question. Senator Inhofe, I recognize you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask unanimous consent that uh, uh, Senator Cory Gardner be recognized for the purpose of introducing his good friend, Commissioner Clark. So ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much uh, to the committee for allowing me to be here today to introduce uh, not only Commissioner Clark, but also to welcome uh, Commissioner Mauck as well from Colorado. And I know that uh, Senator Bennett was here earlier, but due to scheduling conflicts, uh, unable to. So please welcome both of you uh, to the committee. Thank you for holding this very timely hearing to discuss the EPA Army Corps of Engineers uh, new proposed, uh, proposed excuse me, regulation on waters of the United States under the Clean Water Act as we continue to visit this very important discussion. Uh, it's vital that the Federal Government and Congress have a comprehensive understanding of the poten uh, potential impacts that this rule would have on our nation's counties, particularly those counties in the western parts of the United States where our water is and our water law is unique to any other place in the nation. In Colorado, one of the, it's the only 48 uh, state in the 48 contiguous states that all water flows out of and not into presenting a unique challenge for all of us. And your effort to do so today to discuss this issue, I'm pleased that you've invited uh, Sally Clark today. And I'm honored to introduce Commissioner Sally Clark of uh, El Paso County, uh, who is testifying on behalf of the National Association of Counties. Commissioner Clark serves as the Vice President of the National Association of Counties and has been a longtime advocate for, uh, in recent <laughs> upgrades, uh, recent uh, new, new promotions, uh, longtime advocate for Colorado, uh, local government, and unwarranted federal mandates to, uh, to and on our states, and appreciate your willingness and your commitment and dedication to public service. 
You know, it's been an incredible, challenging couple of years for El Paso County, Colorado, <laughs> dealing with forest fires and floods. And in conversations with water districts, conservation districts in Colorado, they continue to believe that under the waters of the United States rule, uh, it could be very devastating for their ability to deliver water for uh, the needs of their customers, their constituencies, and indeed the people of Colorado. With the EPA's own study showing that 68 percent of the streams in Colorado are intermittent, uh, this proposal will have major impact on Colorado, including the energy and agricultural sectors. If you go into the state capital of Colorado, as both commissioners know, uh, there's a poem written on the wall, right in the rotunda, that says, and it starts out by saying this, here is a land where life is written in water. Water is tied to Colorado's history, our land, and our success. And the last thing we need is for the federal government to destroy that incredible legacy that we have with a regulation that goes too far in impacting our agriculture, our land, our water, and our people. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner Clark, welcome. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Senator, so much. Um, thank you, Chairman Inhofe and Schuster, uh, ranking members Boxer and DeFazio, and members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to testify today on the waters of the United States proposed rule and the potential impact on state and local governments. My name is Sally Clark, and I am the first Vice President of the National Association of Counties, the only national organization that represents county governments. For the past decade, I've served as a county commissioner in El Paso County, Colorado, the home of Pikes Peak. My county is considered urban with a population of over 640,000, but with a mix of suburban and rural areas and over 113,000 acres of federal land. In all my travels as a NACO leader, I have heard concerns from across the country about how counties could be affected by the proposed rule. Hearing these concerns and working closely with our technical experts, county engineers, legal staff, public works directors, and stormwater managers, NACO ultimately called for the proposed rule to be withdrawn until further analysis and consultation with local officials is completed. This decision was not taken lightly. I want to be clear, counties support clean water. Our goal is to ensure the public safety and economic vitality of our communities while protecting water quality. In my county and others, we accomplish this through zoning and ordinances, regulating stormwater runoff, prohibiting illegal discharges, and establishing penalties for violations. That said, I'm here today to share with you the four main reasons we decided to call for the withdrawal of this proposed rule. First, this issue is so important because counties build, own, and maintain a significant portion of public safety infrastructure, and the proposed rule would have direct and extensive implications. Local governments own almost 80 percent of all public road miles and also own and maintain roadside ditches, flood control channels, stormwater systems, and culverts. Defining which waters and conveyances fall under federal jurisdiction has a direct impact on counties, as we are legally responsible for maintaining public safety ditches and other infrastructure. Second, the agencies developing the proposed rule did not sufficiently consult with local governments. Counties are not just stakeholders in this discussion. We are partners in our nation's intergovernmental system. By law, federal agencies are required to consult with their state and local partners before a rule is published and throughout its development. Although EPA did initiate discussions on guidance documents, we were not consulted through the 17 months between the guidance consultation and the introduction of the proposed rule, despite repeated requests. This leads to my third point. Due to this inadequate consultation, many terms in the proposed rule are vague and create uncertainty and confusion at the local level. For example, the proposed rule now defines terms like tributary, significant nexus, adjacency, riparian areas, and floodplains. Depending on how these terms are interpreted, additional public infrastructure could fall under federal jurisdiction. The proposed rule, as currently written, only adds to the confusion and uncertainty over how it would be implemented consistently across all regions. 
Our fourth and final reason for calling for the withdrawal is that the current permitting process tied to waters of the U.S. already presents significant challenges for counties. The proposed rule only complicates matters. For example, one Florida county applied for 18 maintenance exemptions on the county's network of drainage ditches and canals. The permitting process became so cumbersome that the county had to hire a consultant to compile all of the technical material required. And three months later, as the county moved into its rainy season and after spending more than half a million dollars invested, decisions on 16 of the exemptions were still pending. Ditches began to flood, putting the public at risk. And this is just one of many examples. In conclusion, while many have attempted to paint this as a political issue, in the eyes of county government, this is a matter of practicality and partnership. We look forward to working with you and the agencies to craft a clear and workable definition of waters of the U.S. that achieves our shared goal, which is to protect water quality without inhibiting the public safety and economic vitality of our communities. Thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, thank you. Mr. Mock, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Chairman Inhofe, Schuster, Ranking Members Boxer and DeFazio, I appreciate this opportunity to testify. My name is Timothy Mock. I was elected to the Clear Creek Board of County Commissioners in 2010 and re-elected in 2014. As a county commissioner, I want to convey how important clean water is for my community. The proposed clean water rule will protect the headwaters, tributaries, and wetlands that are essential for providing the high quality water that supports the hunting, fishing, rafting, and outdoor recreation that are an economic backbone of my community. Clean water from streams and wetlands also provide drinking water for thousands of our residents. Clear Creek County is truly a headwater county. We are bordered by the Continental Divide and provide clean water for downstream communities within the Denver metropolitan area. We are also facing the legacy impacts of historic silver and gold mining. We have struggled with maintaining water quality due to mine runoff and have worked consistently to treat contaminated water and reclaim abandoned mine sites. I know too well the impacts of contaminated water and the costs and time it takes to mitigate and treat it. I also know Clear Creek has made a remarkable rebound over the past 30 years. As we have all made progress, like so much of the country, toward the Clean Water Act goals of fishable, swimmable waters. In addition, these strides in water quality, while important in their own right, have also made Clear Creek County an outdoor recreation destination. By river segment, Clear Creek hosts the second most commercial rafting trips in Colorado. Whitewater rafting alone has a total economic impact to the community of approximately $23 million annually. Hunting and angling generates a total economic impact of nearly $6 million to the county. This is not only the story of Clear Creek, but also across Colorado and the nation. According to the National Shooting Sports Foundation, hunting and angling's total economic impact is $192 billion. Outdoor recreation in Colorado generates $13.2 billion and employs more than 124,000 people. Across the country, it generates $646 billion and 6.1 million jobs. Many of these jobs are dependent on clean water and will benefit from the EPA and Army Corps of Engineers' efforts. In fact, 55% of stream miles in the historic range of native trout in our state are, it, are intermittent or ephemeral and will be protected by the clean water rule. Even with seasonal flows, these waters provide habitat for trout or simply maintain the water quality needed by fish in downstream rivers. And as an avid waterfowler, I've spent many cold mornings in the wetlands, sloughs, and creeks feeding the South Platte and know how important it is to protect these places from irresponsible development. As an elected official with the responsibility of looking after our county's finances, I am also concerned about undue regulatory burden. The EPA and Corps of Engineers have consistently demonstrated that this rule is not an expansion of the Clean Water Act authority. It will restore jurisdiction to fewer of the waters than had been covered from the passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972 until the first Supreme Court decision in 2001 weakened the law. 
During that time period, the population of Clear Creek County increased from approximately 5,900 to 9,400 individuals. Colorado's population doubled from 2.2 to 4.4 million. The state's gross domestic product increased more than tenfold from 13 point to $181 billion. Furthermore, natural gas production increased from 116 cu trillion cubic feet to 817 trillion cubic feet, and coal production increased from 5,500 short tons to 33,000 tons. Although we are small, we are expected to grow in the future. An expansion of, the inter of Interstate 70 is underway, and along with it, a growth in home and road development from those from the nearby metropolitan areas seeking solace in the mountains. In addition, we face a challenge of economic diversification as we approach the end of life of the Henderson Mine, which provides a large portion of our property tax base. There are hundreds of mine claims that exist in undeveloped or undeveloped areas, many of which are very near headwater streams. The rule will help us balance the need for diversification while providing the necessary protection for streams and wetlands as we encourage development of all kinds. If opponents of the rule were worried about returning to the previous jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act, they should realize that protecting intermittent and ephemeral streams and wetlands is fully consistent with population growth, energy production, and economic development writ large. I am ready to have my county's headwaters and wetlands clearly protected under the Clean Water Act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Vick, uh, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Inhofe and Schuster, ranking members Boxer and DeFazio, and members of both honorable committees. I am Lem Shrolovic, the Environmental Bureau Chief in the Office of New York State Attorney General Eric Schneiderman. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to discuss with you the proposed Waters of the U.S. Rule. Uh, back when I was a boy growing up in Wildwood, Georgia, in the early 1970s, many of the creeks and rivers where I hunted and fished were in a sorry state. The Tennessee River was contaminated with toxic industrial waste. When my brother and I floated down Lookout Creek, it started stinking when we reached the railway yards in Wauhatchee. But the pollution problems in my boyhood waters were not local, they were not regional problems, they were national problems. Up in New York, the Bronx River, once the home of beavers, was described as an open sewer. In central New York, people driving by Onondaga Lake during the summer rolled up their windows because the lake smelled so bad. Fortunately, Congress responded and in 1972 passed the Clean Water Act. With the act, Congress fundamentally rewrote federal water pollution control law. The old law had addressed water pollution by authorizing federal cures for water pollution problems on an ad hoc, water by water, problem by problem basis. But that narrow approach had failed. With the Clean Water Act, Congress replaced that failed scheme with a comprehensive approach to pollution control. The waters protected by the Act are broad, covering, as the U.S. Supreme Court has written, virtually all surface waters in the country. With the Act, Congress added the tried and true principle that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. In the ensuing years, the states, EPA, and the U.S. Army Corps together have implemented the statute, and it is working. My boyhood Lookout Creek now hosts a popular nature center. A beaver has returned to the Bronx River, and Onondaga Lake now is one of America's top ten bass fishing destinations. With the proposed rule, the federal agencies that Congress charged with implementing the Act are doing their job. They are providing much needed clarification to the question whether the law applies to a particular water body. Presently, jurisdiction decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis, subject to fractured and inconsistent legal interpretation by the courts. The result is uncertainty, delay, and further litigation. By clarifying where the law applies, the rule will accelerate jurisdiction decisions and make them more predictable and less costly. The proposed rule is grounded in solid peer-reviewed science. 
EPA science report is based on more than 1,200 peer-reviewed scientific studies and has been affirmed by the agency's independent scientific advisory board. The science report shows the powerful influence that upstream waters have on the physical, chemical, and biological integrity of downstream waters. It is important to note that each of the continental states is both upstream and downstream of one or more other state. New York, for example, is downstream of 13 states and is upstream of 19. The proposed rule advances the Clean Water Act's protection of state waters downstream of other states by anchoring a nationwide federal floor for water pollution control. The floor is critical for maintaining the consistency and effectiveness of the downstream states' water pollution programs. This is because the federal statute preempts many common law remedies traditionally used to address interstate water pollution, leaving the, the Clean Water Act as the primary mechanism for protecting downstream states from the effects of upstream pollution. Critically, by protecting interstate waters, the proposed rule allows states to avoid imposing disproportionate and costly limits on dischargers in their own state in order to offset upstream discharges which might otherwise go unregulated. A robust Clean Water Act is important to states and municipalities because by protecting our waters, it keeps billions of dollars in taxpayers' pockets and supports our state economies. In the interests of clean water, the health and welfare of our citizens, and the economy of our states, we should not go back to failed approaches. We should go forward with what is working. The Waters Rule provides much needed clarification regarding the applicability of the Act and anchors an essential nationwide federal floor for water pollution control. We look forward to the completion of a final rule, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. I recognize uh, Senator Inhofe for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will start off with my good friend Scott Pruitt. Now, confession is good for the soul. I am not a lawyer. and. Uh, and so I have to ask some obvious questions of people who are lawyers. Now, I'm going to read something. And tell me, if you would, um, um, in general, what is ambiguous about this language? Section 101G of the CWA states, and this is a quote, it says, the authority of each state to allocate quantities of water within its jurisdiction and that shall not be superseded, abrogated, or otherwise impaired by this act. What is unclear about that? Well, Mr. Chairman, I don't think much. And I don't think that it takes a legal mind to draw that conclusion. I, I would add this as well. Uh, the CWA states in its text that agencies must recognize, preserve, and protect the primary responsibilities and rights of states to plan the development and use of land and water resources. Uh, this body, Congress, recognized at the creation of the Clean Water Act that the role of the states uh, was important, but more than important, it was primary in land use and water management decisions. In the State of Oklahoma, we have a water resources board uh, that is required to measure out permits to those that seek to use water in the State. We have a DEQ that is consistently involved in water quality issues. The decision and the discussion here today is not whether the EPA has any role in the process. They, in fact, do, but they only have a role when we have navigable waters, uh, interconnectivity, uh, because jurisdiction is at issue here, Mr. Chairman. And I think the EPA, through this redefining of states, is seeking to extend its authority to displace and duplicate the state's authority. Yeah, you know, the, uh, both Commissioner Putnam and uh, Commissioner Clark both said statements to the fact that we in Colorado, we in Florida want clean land, we want clean air, we want clean water. Uh, it, it's necessary to reaffirm that. And I won't ask you to answer it because I'll answer it for you. There is this <laughs> assumption that no decisions are good decisions unless they are made in Washington. And whether you picked it up or not during the opening statement of, of the first panel, they feel in those individuals who are embracing their new authority that they are seeking are ones who do not believe that you are capable in the states 
to do as good a job as they would do in the federal government? Well, Senator, Senator, I think in some many instances, even beyond the Clean Water Act, there are those in Washington uh, that populate the EPA and other agencies that see the states as a mere vessel of federal will. And so long as the states agree with the view and the perspective of the agencies here, uh, there is no conflict. Uh, but when there is disagreement uh, about how decisions should be made, and, and I would add this, decisions that have been reserved by this body, by Congress, to the states. Uh, that is when the competition and the conflict arises, and that is what we have here. We have a situation where the EPA is extending its authority into areas that are historically, and I might say almost exclusively, the purview of the states, and they are doing so because they want to dictate to the states how we should manage our water and use our water. Yeah. Well, and, and I appreciate that. We live with this on, on a daily basis. There is some other language in here I am going to ask the three of you uh, to respond to, because when I first read this, I know how I interpret it. It says that agencies have told states that these rules will not actually provide any s certainty because most of the decisions are left to the, quote, best professional judgment of the EPA and the Corps of Engineers. What do you think about that language? Well, I think that and also what the Commissioner mentioned, Mr. Chairman, about the catch-all category. Uh, there is a catch-all category the EPA is proposing with this rule that uh, they, they say the purpose is to provide transparency and predictability and consistency uh, with, the, with respect to the scope of the CWA, CWA, but when it is reduced down to the discretion, the judgment on a case-by-case -case basis, that definitely does not provide certainty and predictability mm -hmm. uh, to those folks that are regulated across the country. You know, the greatest uh, benefit that we have with rule of law and regulation is that those that are subject to regulation know what to expect and know how to conform their conduct. And when we have decisions made on a case-by-case -case basis, that is almost impossible to happen. And so, Senator, I am very concerned not only about what you have raised, but also this catch-all category that we have already identified. Yeah. And do you, uh, uh, Commissioners uh, Putnam and Clark, uh, does that phrase concern you as much as it does me? Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator. Um, yes, it does. Um, I, I think, and, and I heard the EPA this morning even say that, that it was confusing. There were a lot of components that are, that are still confusing. Um, it broadens the number of, of county-maintained public safety dishes and infrastructure that, that would require Section 401 or 404 federal permits, and it is a process that is already cumbersome. There are counties across the nation that I can look to examples where it's it's increased the length of time. It's um, it, the clarity is a problem is how it's being enforced uh, by by regions as well as the headquarters. And I think we heard today that that very thing that there's there's ambiguity and clarification, and we need to be at the table to help solve that problem. Thank you, uh, Ms. Nampatano. Or yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, there is um, an area that we really haven't delved into, and that's the cost of inactivity. And I'd like to ask um, either uh, Mr. Mock or Mr. Slavik, Sralovic, sorry. Uh, several comments uh, uh, on the proposed rules have expressed concern about the cost associated with the rule. But in your personal view or that of your organization, uh, is there a cost associated with the inactivity or uh, uh, when compared to the existing rule? Thank you. Uh, I believe there is a cost, um, and I think the cost is positive. Um, as things exist now, uh, there is fractured, uh, conflicting case law. Um, the courts have invited the agencies to clarify that. Uh, through a rulemaking. And so I think that uh, as time goes by and the status quo remains, there will be a continuing cost in the uh, delay of jurisdiction. I think the rule will very much help clarify when, in most cases, the law applies and when it does not. It is not perfect. It is undergoing uh, further work. There has been a lot of comments, but I think it will help bring down the costs uh, over the status quo. Uh, Mr. Monk. Yeah, if I may, thank you for the question. Um, as a Headwater County, we are consistently under scrutiny in terms of the water and the water quality that, that flows out of our county and downstream uh, to other users. And 
for a small county, the, the treatment of that water uh, continues to, to increase and, and, and becomes very expensive for us. And the assurances that we could put in place to assure the, the, the intermittent streams, the headwaters, especially in a mining, former mining community like mine, or where we still have uh, sites out there, that the water that is, that is coming down from, from those streams are protected, uh, the cleaner that that water is coming into our systems, the cheaper it is for us, and uh, easier for us to send better quality down the hill. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, Mr. Sorolovic, Sur sorry. A suggestion has been made that New York uh, a state is opposed to the rulemaking, and uh, is this uh, position true? Um, I, Congresswoman, I think there's two points here. Um, the answer is no. Uh, New York is not opposed to the rule. Um, our Environment and, and Agricultural Commission Commissioner uh, in New York uh, strongly support agency rulemaking rule to anchor a federal water pollution control floor on a national level, uh, which is essential to protect states from upstream pollution. Uh, the commissioners raised some concerns about the uh, lack of pre-rulemaking consultation with states and some of the definitions of certain terms uh, in the proposed rule. While consultation before is always better than after, the Corps and EPA have undertook uh, significant outreach to states, municipalities, and other stakeholders, holding some 400 meetings around the country. Uh, one of those was in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, where our office uh, participated and uh, gave views, along with many others, about these definitions and the importance uh, of the rule. So. Uh, the agencies also expend, extended their public comment period twice um, and have taken uh, strides uh, to listen to everyone and uh, craft a better, clearer rule. Thank you. Mr. Mock? I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? Well, the question to you would be the uh, uh, opponents of the rule uh, argue that the process was flawed. Uh, that the concerns of the state and local governments were not adequately addressed. Um, were you given ample time and opportunity? Um, I know that they've held, like, like uh, Mr. Srolovic was indicating, there were over 400. Uh, um, was there ample opportunity for input? Yes, you know, this is, uh, th there have been on, dis uh, these discussions have been ongoing for a number of years now. Uh, but there was a, a very lengthy 200 delay days, 200 days for public comment. I believe we've received or there have been submit uh, about a million comments. I feel like I have had adequate time. I've been able to, over the past year, actually address this through letters to the editor, as a matter of fact. So, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yield back. I yield five minutes to myself. Uh, Mr. Sorovall, Sorovall, <laughs> Solovic. Sorry about that. Uh, in your Sorry about that tough name. <laughs> In your testimony, you talk a lot about the need for clarification, and I think there's all agreement on, 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 on CWA. Uh, but, however, I, I find it interesting. I'm looking at the comments made by New York State uh, from, the, from the Environmental Department and the Agricultural Department filed on November 13, 2014. And uh, they're very concerned about the definitional concerns in, in the proposed rule that prevents New York from providing meaningful comments to the impact of the proposal. Uh, economic impacts, a one-size-fits-all approach to redefining the regulation will only lead to legal challenges, cause unnecessary harm to farmers, and could lead to other unintended consequences. And they question the, the process was inadequate because they weren't consolidated enough. So it, I guess my question is, are you aware of those comments? I think you are. Uh, it, did you consult with these state agencies or as being the, representing the Attorney General's Office of the State of New York? Um, we do represent the state agencies uh, in court and on other legal issues. I think the fundamental point uh, raised by the commissioners in that letter was that while there is a need for a rule, it is very important for that rule to have as much clarity in its terms as possible and at the same time maintain a flexibility that reflects regional differences. In New York, we have a lot of water. We're blessed with a lot of water. We have a lot of wetlands. Um, other states, Colorado, uh, very different uh, 
uh, circumstance. Yeah, one size fits all policy. To, I don't <laughs> think, especially with water. But do you agree with these two state agencies in your state that uh, this proposal will, would be an expansion of uh, the regulatory authority of the U.S. EPA under the Clean, Clean Water Act? Uh, we do not see it as a significant expansion of the jurisdiction of the uh, waters of the United States. Um, we think it codifies the uh, principles that have that it properly interprets uh, the guidance that a majority of justices have provided from the U.S. Supreme Court um, and is an important step forward. Okay. Uh, I guess for the other panelists, um, cost to the counties, states, uh, this rule as proposed goes into effect, what is it going to do to the, the, the cost? Do you see for, for your cost of government for local governments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will try and go first and be brief. Um, uh, financially, um, actually, it is, I mean, it is reaching farther out um, based on the ambiguity and the confusion that has been placed on, on the rules. Um, if you look at the Small Business Administration's Office of Advocacy and the analysis that they did, there will be a cost um, not just to small businesses but to small counties, 50,000 or less, and that, that makes up about two-thirds of the nation's population. Um, in addition to that, if we look back and look at the delay of projects is a cost to us locally. The longer we delay, then it puts safety at risk, it puts water at risk, frankly, and water quality. And then the other uh, component of that really is to look back and see when the EPA did their, their analysis and what data they used. Um, and it, it was older data. It wasn't based on, on today's costs in place. So yes, there is a significant cost. I, I want to get to one more question here. So. Um, I'm a firm believer EPA was put into place because we had major problems, point source you saw it in the earlier panel, the Cuyahoga River and all that, and it was structured to be a, a cooperative federalism between the states and, 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 the, and the feds. And with, this, with the federal government in oversight and guidance, that's why the states have to submit the three-year plan of action. So maybe Mr. Pruitt or Mr. Putman might want to comment on how that partnership has been working or not working or what the process has been, you know, just uh, of implementing and enforcing the Clean Water Act. I will be brief. To answer your first question, we know from urban counties just on stormwater and from an agricultural perspective, the number is easily in the billions, easily in the billions, 20 percent increase in jurisdictional wetlands minimum. We know from the previous study that is now 12 years old that it costs over $300,000 to get a 404. And we know the wetlands mitigation is $100,000 per acre to mitigate. So when you grow the impacted areas and you add the regulatory cost and you add the mitigation factors, it is easily in the billions, not only for ag, but also for our counties. And I will uh, let the, uh, my Attorney General friend speak to the uh, partnership issue. You know, Mr. Chairman, I think that that is the concern that, that you have identified. I think historically the relationship has been strong. I mean, in Oklahoma we have water quality issues. Uh, the Illinois River in the eastern part of our state, there have been ongoing concerns between Arkansas and Oklahoma about phosphorus load in, in that body of water. Uh, both the EPA has been concerned about that, but so has the state of, state of Oklahoma. We have actually negotiated a memorandum of understanding with, uh, with Arkansas, and we have worked on both sides of the border to take regulatory steps to reduce phosphorus levels in the Illinois River. And so I think you see uh, examples both at the state level and at the federal level concern about water quality. But here, my, my comments to, to the panel and to the committee are focused more upon uh, this expanded view. Uh, of the definition that gives the EPA jurisdiction to interpose itself into those areas that are traditional, historical, and I believe lawful to the states on primacy. And that is what we are seeing with this expanded definition, Mr. Chairman. Yep, thank you. Uh, Mr. Duncan, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the the uh, Rapanos uh, clean water decision was mentioned when I was here this morning briefly. Let me read what the uh, Federal District Judge said in that case. He said, I don't know if it's just a coincidence that I just sentenced Mr. Gonzalez, a person selling dope on the streets of America. He's here illegally. He's not an American citizen. He has a prior criminal record. So here we have a person who comes to the United States and commits crimes of selling dope, and the government asked me to put him in prison for 10 months. And then we have an American citizen who buys land, pays for it with his own money, and he moves some sand from one end to the other, and the government wants me to give him 63 months in prison. 
And this federal district judge said, now that isn't our system gone crazy. I don't know what is, and I'm not going to do it. Well, he was reversed. But it shows uh, you, you can take any of these laws uh, too far. And, and I can tell you, no one is talking about to doing away with the Clean Water Act or going back to where we were in 1970. But it's also ridiculous to uh, act like we haven't made any progress and that things are worse now than they were in the 70s, so we have to make these rules even tougher. And I remember when I chaired this subcommittee, the mayor of Los Angeles came to me and he said the EPA was coming down with some new regulations about uh, Greece. And he said, we've got over 10,000 restaurants in Los Angeles. He said, most of them are small mom and pop restaurants. He said, this is going to run several thousand of those small mom and pops out of business. And, and we, we got that uh, stopped. But I can tell you that uh, people sit up here in Washington and they write these rules and regulations. They're mostly people who have spent their entire careers in government. Many of them have spent their entire careers here. They don't realize the effect that these rules and regulations, most of them help the big, big giants in, in the industry, but they really hurt the small farmers and the small ranchers and the small businesses. And in fact, the SBA said of this rule that we're talking about, the SBA Office of Advocacy put out this statement and said, small businesses are extremely concerned about the rule as proposed. The rule will have a direct and potentially costly impact on small businesses. The limited economic analysis which the agency submitted with the rule provides ample evidence of a potentially significant economic impact. And I, you know, I, I noticed in the biographies, I, I was here for an hour this morning and I listened to uh, Administrator McCarthy and, and um, uh, uh, Secretary Darcy, and I noticed in their biographies, neither one of them has uh, ever run a uh, managed a farm or a ranch or been in a small business. They just don't understand the pressures. Because these positions, these uh, 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 jobs are and how tough it is when you have to fight ordinary competition, but then you have to take on your, your government with unlimited, uh, with, that has unlimited funds when you have to take them on to boot. And then people wonder why so many small businesses go out of business and all these college graduates wonder why we have so many of them working as waiters and waitresses in restaurants because we've sent millions of other countries for the last 40 years or so, and a, and a lot of it, an awful lot of it, is because of the environmental rules and regulations. And if we don't wake up and realize that, we're going to keep hurting these small businesses, these small ranches, these these uh, uh, small farms, and. I just get sick and tired of these uh, bureaucrats sitting up here coming up with these rules and regulations that they have no understanding of who it's going to hurt, how much effect it's going to have. I remember when I uh, chaired this subcommittee, we had a farmer, a cranberry farmer from Massachusetts who broke down in tears talking about the effect that some, uh, some of these EPA clean water rules were already having on his uh, farm. And to come in and expand them at this point now is, 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 just, uh, uh, is just wrong in my opinion. And uh, so I'm opposed to it. And I, I noticed that almost all the small business, almost all the agriculture and farm groups uh, um, are opposed to it too. Finally, I'll just say I think I'm the only one here that's uh, uh, served with uh, uh, Secretary Putnam. He was a great member of Congress, and he's got a great future ahead of him in the state of Florida. I also uh, uh, had the privilege of serving uh, General with your governor, and she was a fine member, an outstanding member of this uh, body also, and I'm real proud of the work she's doing as your governor. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Okita, five minutes. Before. Well, thank you, Chairman. It's great to be on your subcommittee. Appreciate being here. As you can tell, I'm new to the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. That might explain the gap here. <laughs> well, there's uh, no full committee hearing here. Right, right. Panel one, where all the hubbub was, uh, which, uh, Secretary, that's where I had the plague. I had the plague earlier this morning, but I'm here now. Um, I really enjoyed being this close because I got to really focus in on each of your uh, testimonies and appreciate them. As former Indiana Secretary of State, I uh, really look to county government to help solve our problems, just like I think Washington should be looking to the states to do the same. In fact, I was in Colorado where I learned about vote centers. 
uh, from one of your counties. And I know several Indiana clerks uh, are members of, of NACO. And, but we took vote centers back to Indiana and implemented them there. It was good stuff. In that vein, I, I'm surprised to hear uh, a local official like you, uh, Commissioner Mock, look to the federal government almost solely to solve your problem is what I, and that's what I got from your testimony, whether it was the clean water or the, or the wildlife that, that helps, uh, that the water helps flourish. Uh, uh, I couldn't understand when I was listening to your testimony why you, as a reelected elected official, uh, feel powerless to solve these problems yourself or to go to your state legislature. Now remember, before you answer, unless Senator Gardner was wrong, and feel free to correct him, all water flows out of Colorado, right? So you're in almost a unique or particularly good situation uh, to take care of this situation. Why won't you? Well, like I said in my testimony, Clear Creek County uh, does. We do take uh, an opportunity. We work with the Watershed Foundation to clean up a good. lot of, of, of our water. What's the need? Us. What's the need uh, to expand this definition? The, the, the need is the uncertainty, the, the, the regulatory uncertainty yeah. in terms of uh, what waters are in, what waters are out. Uh, the, the delays in the permitting as we, as we work yeah, on these issues. Yeah, I want to talk about the delay. testimony about the delays in the permitting. This expands the jurisdiction of the agency over water. So by definition, you're going to get more permits. So how is getting more permits, because there's going to be more water under, ju under jurisdiction, speed up the permitting process? Well, the last thing they want to give these, uh, this, uh, this, these agencies, and I don't just mean the EPA, but they all seem pretty inept in terms of turning work product around. Why would we give them more Paperwork. And it's my understanding that this does not expand the jurisdiction of the Why do you Water think Act. That? Oh, it doesn't expand the jurisdiction. Does not, is, is, is my understanding. Yeah, you state that in your testimony too. But on the other hand, you suggest that the rule would protect intermittent ephemeral streams and wetlands that are currently not federally regulated. Don't these arguments contradict each other? But they were once regulated before, and I think there's more certainty back then with the 2001 and 2006 court rulings. Uh, we've kind of entered this, this gray area now uh, where we don't exactly understand what is and what is not. Now, I, I'm dealing with a, a small business uh, community that, that's outdoor recreation centric, and the small mom and pop uh, delis and, and, and ice cream shops that operate on the backs of the rafting companies, the, the, the outfitter, com uh, outfitter companies, um, the people that come in to, to camp and, and recreate and fish and angle. Um, not having uh, certain protections in place or not being clear to me is rolling the dice on that outdoor recreation industry. And, and for, for me, that's all I have after the Henderson mine in, for my community. But it, it's a very robust economic engine for not only Colorado, but also the rest Why of the nation. Why can't a county commission ordinance take care of this? Why can't you legislate this yourself? I can't speak to the legalities. I'm, I'm not an attorney. I no, think that's, that's, that's I think a federalism. Question. It's, not, it's not a legality. It's no, called it's, it's, sovereignty of a state, it's, and in your situation, sovereignty of a county. And you've been elected by people to act. And it sounds like what you're doing is saying exactly what Attorney General Pruitt was trying to get at, where there's people in this country that unfortunately think they have to be vessels of the federal government. And I'm going to let uh, Attorney General Pruitt comment on that and Secretary Putnam we have about 30 seconds if you can divide that and but I appreciate your testimony I want to see if you have anything to add to this exchange we just had. Well I do want to provide a comment with respect to the case law just momentarily it, you know the, there have been two recent decisions the solid waste uh, uh, agency of Na Northern Cook County and, and also the Rapinus decision that's already been highlighted and uh, in the Swant decision uh, the, the authority the, the court held that uh, uh, the Corps of Engineers exceeded its authority by attempting to regulate non-navigable, isolated interstate waters. Uh, in the Rapinus decisions, they held that the core waters must be navigable waters or at least reasonably made to be so. Uh, there's a reason for that. It's called the Interstate Commerce Clause. And uh, this body, Congress, has authority uh, with respect to issues that uh, involve interstate commerce as it relates to water. If you're dealing with purely intrastate water uh, that cannot be reasonably connected, uh, to an interstate body of water, uh, the jurisdiction is exclusively within the states. And that's the, that's the tension here. Uh, and so uh, when you talk about issues of federalism, I agree with you, Congressman. I believe that, that the states are taking, and in fact have taken, I know Oklahoma has done this, we have a robust regulatory regime. I've mentioned the Water Resources Board and the DEQ working together to deal with land use and management and water quality issues. There are 
issues, and I mentioned one, the Illinois River, with phosphorus load that, that is affecting us from Arkansas, where the EPA has jurisdiction. Uh, but we should be very leery of a, uh, an approach that, that yields to the Federal Government um, a takeover of that land use and water quality issues that are reserved to the States presently. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Van Tempel, you have something to enter for the record? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, there was a, a statement by Ms. Clark, I believe, that the uh, SBA advocacy uh, was concerned about the impact this has on, on small business. So I have a release dated October the 2nd from the American Sustainable Business Council uh, stating that it appears SBA is arguing that polluting industries have the right to externalize the pollution and harm downstream businesses and communities. This organization apparently has 200,000 businesses, 325,000 entrepreneurs, executives, managers. I would like to introduce into the record, please. Uh, so ordered. I would like to thank our witnesses for your testimony today. Your contribution to today's discussion is, is very insightful and will be very helpful. Hopefully, we are going to address some legislation. We can get something passed. I, I do believe it is the role of Congress to address this. I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing, and unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Um, any other members have anything else? Great hearing. If not, the meeting is adjourned.